This is Guitar Business Radio, the podcast for the business of guitar. No reviews, no demos, no idle chatter, just useful dialogue and information to help you get the most out of your guitar-related business. Whether you're a guitar builder or a guitar player, or just something in between, this is for you. Now, here's your host. Oh, wait, it's me, Jeffrey D. Brown. So let's get to it. From Guitar Business Media, this is episode 21 of GBR, the podcast for the business of guitar. And I suspect a good number of you have recently returned from Summer Nam in Nashville, or you're en route as we speak. And we're, we're going to have some additional perspective and reporting on, the, on that event in next week's show, so that'll be a good reason for you to come back. Not the only reason, but, but one of them. Today, however, we have an important special guest with us. In a few minutes, I'll be speaking with David Kalt, the CEO of Reverb.com. Now, he's going to give us some of the backstory that led up to the launch of Reverb. And we're going to hear about several lesser known but highly significant services the company offers that uh, I think have the potential to dramatically change the landscape for sellers around the world. And there's a lot more. It's a great interview, so stick around for that. Now, one of the things that we're going to be doing on a regular basis is keeping you up to date on the developments surrounding the launch of our new property, Guitar Business Magazine. Now, we made the official announcement in last week's episode 20, and this week we're revealing yet another very important part of this project. Guitar Business Magazine is launching later this fall, and while it will provide in-depth and lasting content in a more traditional format with a long shelf life, Guitar Business Daily will offer a constant flow of timely news and information suitable for, yep, you guessed it, spontaneous consumption. So the Daily will launch sometime in August. Not quite sure of the date yet, but uh, we'll definitely keep you posted. I also want to stress, too, that we're working full speed on all this. And in fact, we're now accepting news releases from all guitar-related businesses and organizations right now, right now for the Daily. And you can, you can find out more about that at our website, guitar.business. That's guitar.business, no.com. And uh, that's in a section called editorial. There's some other stuff there, too, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at it. You can also put us on your media list, send materials directly to editor at guitar.business. And if you need some assistance in putting your news together properly, well, that's something we know a little bit about. And, uh, of course, we would be happy to... Uh, help you. Also, we just added a couple of new editorial contributors to the magazine and the daily. Uh, It's pretty exciting. We're certainly going to be adding more in the weeks to come, and we will announce some of those a little bit later this month. So while we're moving at a a really rapid pace with all this, you know, it's still a pretty low profile ramp up, at least publicly. But like most other things you get from us, we're doing this a little bit differently also. And like I said, um, I've been involved in the launch of many publications of all kinds and a whole lot of uh, ancillaries as well. And typically, we would always be much further along before we even let the cat out of the bag. We would uh, generally have uh, enough ads sold uh, to be viable before we even made any big announcements. But this is a different world now uh, than even just a few years ago. So what we're doing is basically an incremental launch. And we're sharing that process with our listeners for at least a couple of good reasons. Obviously, we want to build interest and anticipation and get people involved. But the other thing is, and I I really didn't think of this originally, but this is a business show. Why not share the progress along the way? I mean, we're obviously not going to give away information that might compromise our competitive interests. But there's a lot we can talk about as we go, because just like this show has evolved constantly since day one. And... Look, we've embarked on several content and management roads that have uh, frankly turned out to not be compatible with our mission. We've had to make quick course corrections along the way, and I've been very transparent about it. If we learn something from the experience, why not pass that along to our listeners so they might benefit from that knowledge as well? So in some respects, that's kind of what we're doing with the magazine and the daily. Between now and the time that all these things come to life, And, you know, it happens quicker than we might expect, always, it seems like. Uh, 
you know, we're going to be making a lot of tweaks and adjustments. Most of them you won't ever see or hear about because there's just too many on a daily basis. But we'll give you some of the highlights and hopefully you'll get some value out of that. And again, uh, this approach is very consistent with a lot of things I talk about frequently, like not losing sight of the destination or destinations, because often there's more than one and they're frequently related. In the process, though, we have to be flexible enough to go off script when a new opportunity presents itself. You know, there's another simple saying that I keep on the tip of my brain at all times. This or something better. This or something better. Keep that idea at close reach. And when it seems like something isn't quite going right or may not work, just say this or something better. It can really be a game changer. Now let's move on to something in the shorts. This is your source for profoundly interesting news briefs. Guitar Business Radio presents The Shorts. Well, back in episode 16, we interviewed Eastwood Guitar CEO Mike Robinson. I thought it was an enlightening interview in many ways, in large part because they've taken a very creative approach as a manufacturer of all kinds of guitars, basses, and variations. Their claim to fame has always been replica and tribute style instruments, many of which had their origins in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even later. We also talked about their unique approach to operating a custom shop, which is modeled somewhat on the crowdfunding idea. And if you've not listened to that interview, I would certainly recommend it. Now, Eastwood has more recently begun manufacturing new and original lines of guitars in conjunction with designers like Dennis Fano and John Backlund and others. Backlund's unique designs uh, have been available for years on a very limited basis. And now under Eastwood's program, they're widely available and reasonably priced. The partnership with Dennis Fano, who created the Revolta and Novo lines of guitars, has manifested into something broader for Eastwood. In the interview, we talked about a recent guitar festival in Liverpool where Eastwood operates their European distribution hub. During that festival, Mike and his team erected a pop-up retail store with something like uh, more than 100 different instruments from their existing line of over 250. The store was apparently a success, and I asked Mike about the possibility of doing more pop-ups, including here in the United States. His answer was positive, but now we've seen the first implementation of this idea, although it's not in the pop-up format, but rather a permanent showroom in Nashville. They just opened the new showroom during the Summer NAMM show. Pretty good timing. And it's located in the Novo Guitars USA manufacturing facility. And if you're a visitor to the showroom, I understand you can schedule a factory tour if, if that's something you're interested in. Now, even though Eastwood's partnership with Dennis Fano focuses on the Revolta and Novo lines, I understand the showroom features many products from the Eastwood and Airlines guitar lines as well as some boutique amps and effects pedals. And I just heard before doing this segment that Eastwood apparently is opening another one of these showrooms in Chicago this August. And I would uh, assume that it may be in some way related to the fact that their main distribution center for North America is also located in that city. So we'll keep an eye on that. Now, I don't know if there's a rough similarity to the Apple Store idea here, and while I think Eastwood is positioned well to do this kind of thing, we'll have to see if other manufacturers or distributors investigate this option. If so, we'll report on it here, as well as in Guitar Business Daily, which launches next month. Now, if you'd like more information on any of this, we've reposted this audio segment, as well as some important links in the Shorts section under the Episodes tab on GuitarBusinessRadio.com. Now, for something entirely different. David Kalt is the founder and CEO of Reverb.com, the online marketplace for buying and selling new, used, and vintage music gear. The site currently has over 250,000 sellers, 10 million monthly visitors. The marketplace is comprised of buyers and sellers from beginner musicians, brick and mortar shops, and boutique builders to collectors, large retailers, popular manufacturers, and even rock stars. And believe me, there's much more, and we'll hear all about it 
as David Kalt joins us right here and right now. Well, David, thank you so much for taking the time out of your very busy schedule and coming on GBR with us. Excited to be here, Jeff. I really, um, I love your program and I'm excited to share some of the reverb story with you. Awesome. Well, as my listeners know, I, I almost, well, I always start off with something uh, about these uh, foundational components. We like to talk about building blocks that um, form the foundation upon which careers and businesses sit on top of. And, you know, I'd like to know what kinds of things in your history represent building blocks for you, which have had the most impact. You know, um, well, I mean, I, you know, I grew up in the seventies and, and definitely, you know, music has had a huge impact on me. You know, the kind of music I grew up with from, you know, breaking those Led Zeppelin al- al- albums to those early police albums and, and Bob Marley and Bob Dylan and the influence of the sixties and seventies and, and early eighties, uh, music had such impact on, on who I am as a, as a business person, as a, as an individual, as someone who really wants to um, create, you know, great music or great businesses, it's all the same. It's just this desire for creating and building things. Um, but definitely started off with a love for music. When I was 18, I uh, bought my first guitar, saved up a bunch of money for my first guitar, and I didn't have any formal music education. I was more self-taught and wanted to uh, I wanted to get at get at it. I didn't. Uh, I wasn't really as focused on joining bands and playing in that way as much as I was in the studio. I loved the the, the studio sound, and I, I pursued um, as a hobby recording engineering in the '80s. Mm-hmm. And then ultimately, I um, I did that post college as a recording engineer. Let me ask for you, a couple let, of years. Let me interject one thing. I I don't like to do that, but but do you remember? Or can you tell me what that first guitar was? Do you remember what kind it was or? Yeah, it was a, a Japanese import of, uh, it wasn't an Ibanez, but it was, I don't even recall, a Greco. It was a Greco uh, 335 style uh, Japanese import. Mm-hmm. And uh, I recently sold it actually, um, but it was, uh, it was given to me by my cousin, the first one, but I always wanted a Stratocaster. So when I saved up enough money, I bought my first Stratocaster at 18 or 19. That was when I considered it was my first guitar that I actually went out and bought. And it was uh, a 70s Stratocaster at the time, which wouldn't have been considered vintage in the I, 80s. Yeah, I had but, one of um, It was too. a big, <laughs> it, yeah. was, it was a black Strat, uh, you know, Eric Clapton inspired. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. Okay, so you, uh, I interrupted you, but but I'll let you go ahead and continue as you uh, went into the recording part of it. And that was yeah, so my, my passion to, to be in the business and, and be involved in the creation of music was geared around, uh, focused on uh, engineering, uh, music production, studio work. But I realized pretty quickly after a year or two of it, I wasn't going to be great at it. And to make a living as an engineer, you have to really be great and you really have to um, um, put in the hours and, and pursue. So I gracefully said, um, I'm not going to, this isn't, this isn't going to turn out well if I, if I commit my entire life to um, a a life of production and engineering and I pivoted to software. Um, So I started my first software business in, uh, in the early nineties after leaving the studio business. I was really inspired by actually all the digital movement that was happening in the studio business, going from tape to um, digital devices like the Sinclair or Mm -hmm. we had an SSL board at the Mm -hmm. time that we, that was all automated. So um, that really inspired me. And then I I taught myself um, to code and eventually started my first software company in the travel industry. I had a background, my family was in the travel industry back in Michigan and I built a database system, a CRM called client base that was geared towards um, helping the travel industry. travelers do do more travel marketing was that fairly well received it was it was my uh we launched it in uh i launched it in 93 94 and uh i ended up selling it to uh ultimately american airlines or part of saber in 98 99 and um so here i was almost 30 and i had sold my first company and i was uh pretty much on top of the world um, feeling, feeling pretty good about it. I had a non-compete in that industry. So the good thing about a non-compete is it says, well, what else can I do? Um, For, how can I reinvent you. myself? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It forces you. So that was your first big payday. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, uh, I think I had, a st- I started buying, that's when actually I started getting a little bit more acquired taste for guitars. I didn't buy like real heavy vintage, which I should have, this is the late nineties. I should have of course. really loaded up on some vintage, but I, I remember I bought an ES one twenty five. I bought a, like a 52 tally reissue. Oh. So I started to sort of get a, a taste for uh, having some guitars around, around the house and some recording equipment as well. Um, but then I launched my next business, um, which is totally in a different industry. It was in the world of finance, mm-hmm. but it was, it was a similar strategy. I was trying to, um, I mean, a similar strategy to what we've done with reverb is there was a pain point in online investing. And this is 1999, 2000. And, and if you went to go trade options at a, a company like E-Trade or Ameritrade or Schwab, um, they offered the service, but they did it in a very um, limiting way. And it ended up being very expensive and the customer service was poor and the user experience was pretty weak. So after doing that um, and learning the hard way through those other platforms, I said, I'm going to go build a trading platform for options traders and make it really easy for retail investors to learn how to trade options like the pros. And that's what was the vision was Options Express. It was very much retail focused, uh, not focused on professionals and making it easy, fun and affordable for the everyday person to use options just like a professional would. We launched it in 2000 and it ended up being a... uh, pretty big success. And ultimately we took it public in 2005 and uh, ultimately was acquired by Charles Schwab in 2010. Okay. So, so that was another a, payday. 10%, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. That was a big, that was a big payday. Yeah, that was, uh, that was a, you know, uh, 150 to one kind of payday where hmm. early investors and uh, my partners and I did uh, extraordinary well uh, by building, uh, by, you know, by innovating and we were extremely lean. We did not raise a lot of money. We did it. We did it with just intuition and, and good strategy. Nice. Um, but after that, I was completely ready to, uh, get back to music and, um, I did it in a, uh, another big way in, in another big way. <laughs> I acquired a pretty substantial, um, guitar store and, uh, the Chicago music exchange. Right, and, right, right. Um, that, uh, that was kind of the, which you're still in, which you still have to, strategy. you still have it today, right? That's part of your correct, portfolio. Correct. I have a partner uh, and a CEO who mm-hmm. runs it day to day, so sure. I can focus on Reverb. Of course, but um, still very, very involved in. It. Let me ask you because that kind of leads me into another question here um, about when you bought Chicago Music Exchange. If you can put it in this way, uh, what? were some of the uh, things that surprised you the most about that business if you if you were surprised at all and i imagine you must have been at least once right oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah well the first the first thing was is i was i was a fender guy um i was a stratocaster telecaster guy i had bought one gibson um a 58 reissue but i didn't uh i, I wasn't as deep into the gibson catalog as i was the fender catalog so when I got into the business, I hadn't, I didn't really understand all the history around the Les Paul and the holy grail of vintage collecting. I didn't really understand the depth of the vintage market and the 50s and 60s and how broad it was. So that was the first uh, awakening, just in terms of going beyond what I loved and recognizing that people love Mosrite guitars because of the Ventures, or people loved, you know, Gretsch's because of Chet Atkins, and a total appreciation for the country, uh, not just the sort of classic rock that I had grown up with, appreciation for the jazz guitars, Elvis Presley, Scotty Moore. So forcing myself to broaden my vision of what does it mean to be a great musician across all these different genres uh, of America. The other thing that surprised me was the nostalgia and the collectors, people that really wanted a piece of the past and people that really loved um, the instrument for what it stood for not just for something you could play and have intrinsic value. I started to get a better sense of the, the intrinsic value of an instrument versus its nostalgic collector um, great value and starting to think about it as an asset class, um, which is something I hadn't thought about, that it could actually have value as an asset class. The other thing that I took away from it was the dealer spread. Remember, I'm a guy, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, a programmer, so I'm a software guy, I'm a finance guy, I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm a musician. I was kind of astounded by the spread, and that was what kind of got me excited for the opportunity when I saw how dealers were, rightfully so, 
taking a, a pretty big spread on used instruments between the buy, the bid and the ask because um, they were acting as an intermediary of risk. And I understood that well, but I also felt ultimately as I launched Reverb, I realized that was going to be a deterrent in growing the market. The dealer spread ultimately was not going to help, but was not going to grow the market. It's the same experience I had in the world of finance too. And then the third thing is the sort of lack of customer service uh, at the retail level call it intimidation when you go into a guitar store, call it snobbery, that that was something that I was not, uh, that I didn't think was going to be an enabler of growth. And I was really tuning into how to, you know, take the Howard Schultz of the Starbucks concept, how to offer your people insurance, how to make people excited about coming to work and give them a career, give your staff and your people a real career and a real opportunity that this is not just a hobby or a business of leisure. This is a real business with real opportunity and people take music very seriously. So music retailers should take it very seriously and treat their people uh, with that kind of respect. That's a, that's a great way to do it. Great way to look at it. More people should do that. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess that kind of brings it. I mean, we could, we could talk about CME. I used to work for a company called CME. So I, it comes out of my mouth uh, easily, (laughs) but but, um, let's move to the big topic of conversation. First, I'd like to know a little bit more about the launch of Reverb and what kinds of challenges you might have encountered along the way. And again, I'm, I'm sure there were, but what you did to counter those things. Well, in my heart or my gut, I knew that for Reverb to be successful, I needed to take the some of the elements of Craigslist, some of the elements of eBay, And some of the elements of some of these really established dealers that had great knowledge and expertise. And I needed to bring those together in an ecosystem where they all could coexist. Right. So um, to me, the value was going to be in bringing lots of individuals, giving them lots of information, inspiration, pricing data, things to make the average consumer more knowledgeable about all the information that I now had after running a store for two or three years and making that information very transparent and very open to the public. And that that would be the premise for an ecosystem or a platform that would attract lots of people, lots of eyeballs and ultimately lots of transactions. Mm -hmm. So I approached it with transparency. um, And I also approached it that I wasn't focused on, uh, getting any of the 800 pound gorillas in the, in the room at first, I was focused on a lot of littles, a lot of small individual makers of products, um, small, um, at home retailers, people that knew, uh, little niches within the industry business. And they could, they could sell their goods on a platform that had, a, a good customer service, good technology and low fees. And that was, a, that was the premise. And that's still the premise today is, is that build an affordable platform with great product experience and then blow them away with good service. Great strategy. Service is so important. I mean, it's an important part of our lives anyway. Look, you know, it transcends business and everything else. And a lot of people talk a lot about the concept of service. It has many applications, but you've illustrated one that certainly manifests um, in your business. Exactly. Um, so this might be a little trivial, and I, I'm guessing that maybe you've been asked this like a million times or so, but I don't think I've actually heard the story of how and why you chose the name Reverb, and uh, maybe this makes me out of touch in this particular area, but uh, I'd like to know a little bit about that. And then secondly, it's a little more esoteric, uh, do you think in some way that uh, you've changed the meaning of the word as far as what most people think of when they first hear it? Yeah, well, well, first, Jeff, um, I've done a lot of interviews and no one's asked me that. I love <laughs> it. Great, I love it. <laughs> See, I was covering. Where is that? I, was I, like, was, Duh. I was doing like, a little. That'd be the first question I would have asked too. Thank you. I was just um, doing a little advanced CYA there to make sure that. I, <laughs> good work. Good work. So you know, interestingly enough, after I um, I departed from Options Express as CEO in 2008, I set up a small trading company because I was still. Um, interested in doing some finance and trading. And I actually, I came up with the name Reverb Capital. And so the roots kind of came back before I even bought Chicago Music Exchange. I love the word Reverb and and it has so much more connotation today. But back then 
I really did cho- choose the name because I love the dual meaning of the term, right? It's synonymous with a certain kind of effect used by vocalists, guitarists, and drummers. Now, the interesting thing, it's not just a guitarist thing. I mean, most musicians know what reverb is. So that's, you don't, you know, you can't say the same thing about flangers or delays, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, reverb has a broader context, but the meaning of reverberation and taking something from its source and making it much bigger and spreading that hence reverberate like that's powerful to me that that really um, um, inspired me to say I'm not I don't take this challenge lightly that I, I need this to reverberate the power of the network is the reverberation of, of thousands of musicians kind of sharing in their gear and creating a more musical world. So I, I really took that um, that name as, a, as as an opportunity to think big. As far as where it's got, I mean, I'm I'm still a little more um, grounded in the sense that uh, when I see reverb, I still think of you know um, uh, boss pedals and, and the big uh, spring, the big spring reverb. Yeah, the yeah, big. We spring. had I think we had and one the, of those the, things. But. And my Fender amps, you yeah. know, my Fender reverb. Yeah. Um, but. You are correct. People are um, using the name reverb in the context that is uh, becoming synonymous with uh, buying and selling of gear in a place where musicians go and discover. And uh, so I will continue to ride that way. But I still um, I still think reverb has been around for a long time as a uh, as an effect. And uh, I'll still uh, I'll still stick to its roots. Yeah, I mean, I I think there's no question that, you know, you've had a an effect on how we perceive that. But here's a, and I guess I like these two-part questions. Um, let's start with this one. Um, I'd like for you, if you could, to explain us a, to explain to us um, a little bit more about what you're doing with reverb sites and how they uh, integrate in with one's reverb shop, two different things. And uh, the second part of the question um, is a bit more general, and I'm wondering uh, what you see as the most compelling and lasting innovations on Reverb that you think will have a long-term impact on the industry in general. Uh, going back to the sites thing, I think uh, I've, I've been involved in building a couple of hundred websites in the last 20 years, among many other things. So I found this pretty interesting, and I'd like you to, to start off by telling us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, Reverb sites, um, it seemed pretty uh, natural evolution to us once we realized that uh, dealers and individuals had started to upload their inventory and take photos and write descriptions. We had all this great inventory there that a lot of effort was spent on syncing inventory between uh, different e-commerce platforms and back office systems. And it became evident that, that our customers were asking us, well, could you build my website for me? You have, um, I'm so committed to reverb. It's got all these capabilities. I do my customer service on there. I message customers. Why can't you build us a platform? So it seemed pretty obvious that it was that the amount of effort for us to expand their reverb shop or the shop that they have on the reverb platform into their own individualized website. Well, it was a, you know, pretty big, uh, software, uh, uh, challenge. It was a very natural, organic thing for us to do. Mm-hmm. Um, we're still pretty new to it. We're around 18 months into it, and we've got thousands of reverb uh, sites up, people tying their domains to a reverb-driven site. You wouldn't even know the difference there. Um, they look completely different, completely customizable by the, by the user. And um, what we've discovered is that the power of the reverb experience, both in terms of the checkout, the messaging, the negotiating, we've incorporated all those features into reverb sites, wow. making reverb sites um, way more industry specific than a Shopify or a big commerce, one of these more generic e-commerce platforms. So we've, um, we've given the industry a way to um, interact with their customers in a, in a, in a more um, vertical way which we think is going to be really, really powerful. Now we offer it for free. So reverb sites is free. All we want to do is really (laughs) is make, um, um, and there is a transaction fee when the transaction happens, but the the website itself is free. So you get a lot of exposure from it. You get great SEO. We actually are, have components where we're spending money on Google AdWords as part of your reverb shop site. And um, so it's a really, uh, there's a, there's a ton of value in there and, and people are loving it. 
And um, it's giving, um, it, it also is helping us. Remember, a big part of our strategy is if we can help the small independent retailer go omni-channel, because in, in 2018, if you're a brick and mortar shop and you're dependent on people walking in your door for all of your sales, you're going to struggle and you're probably going to be out of business at some point. Yeah, that's right. If we can help you be a brick and mortar shop and a successful online shop and help you do that hybrid model, which I firmly believe is a, is the future, you can thrive. So we believe that between sites and reverb and running your shop, and we're going to give you more tools to help you integrate with your shop and point of sales tools and helping customers check out. We're going to build all those capabilities because we believe that ultimately is going to create this, this great hybrid experience. Cause we believe that the customer also wants to shop online, but they still want the store to exist. They want to be able to try uh, the product and experience the product in a showroom. So we do believe in that hybrid model and it's a big part of our, uh, it's a big part of our strategy in general. So you're kind of, but to answer your, well, I just wanted to say that I, it feels to me like what you're doing with Reverb Sites is kind of what you did with Reverb in comparison to eBay. You're doing this in comparison to uh, Shopify or something like that. You're really bringing that into a much more uh, a specific market and adapting it specifically to that, that market. So the parallel seems you know pretty straight ahead to me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The, uh, the verticalization of your e-commerce platform, the verticalization of your marketplace, that is, that is kind of how, how, um, we've evolved on these two, on these two, um, paradigms. I think though, your second question had to do with the long-term impact on the industry in general. And this is, yeah. you know, my answer may be a little bit controversial here, but we love um, controversy. Remember, <laughs> I know. Re remember when I told you about, how I was a little bit surprised at the, the spread that dealers were taking on used instruments when I bought Chicago Music Exchange. Well, that resonated with me because of my, my trading and finance background. I really believe in efficient markets. And I, 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 what, I, what I realized when I launched Reverb is that that, that dealer offering people a low balls, low ball offer for their gear and doubling their 100% markup was actually hurting the industry. As we bring thousands and thousands of buyers and sellers together, what we're doing is we're creating price improvement. And by creating price improvement, the instrument that you used to be able to buy a used, a used let's say, Martin guitar for $1,000, and then you would go and sell it to your dealer for $500, You'd only do that once because you were not going to, you're not going to buy another used instrument and then feel, and, and then feel that you lost if you didn't love it. But with reverb, what we've tried to do is you tried to make that used instrument now that you can buy that same used instrument for maybe $750. And if you don't love it after six months or a year, or you're, or you're loving, loving something else, um, your next instrument's only going to be $750 or $800. You're going to be able to get most of that money back because you actually bought something at closer to fair value as yeah. opposed to the dealer spread. What we've seen just in, in the four years that we've been functioning is we've seen musicians take greater chance on gear that buying it online because they know they're not going to lose money. And musicians are smart. Consumers are smart in general. If you empower them with information and tools to make good decisions about this, buying this versus that, they will, they will do that over time. So we believe that, that however big the industry is today, that by making the used market more efficient, we're going to pump billions and billions of dollars of consumer buying power into this industry to buy both new and used instruments and to allow instruments instead of being hoarded and sitting in closets or in you know, man caves, they're going to actually get out and be played more and distributed around the world. Do you expect any pushback from any sectors, <laughs> anybody on that? I mean, you, well, I mean, you know, you said controversial. I mean, I can see the, the potential controversy in it, but um, do you expect any pushback? Well, I think in the end, everyone will win because musicians are going to um, get fair value. For, and there's, there's more musicians than there are suppliers, right? Mm -hmm. So musicians are going to get fair value for their instruments. Suppliers 
Ironically, the amount of indi- the, the industry produces $15 billion a year in, in product. Of that 15 billion, I've estimated around 10 billion of it, 10 billion will be around for 50 years. It's not going to the graveyard. It's not going to the garbage, you know, the garbage bin. It actually sticks around for 50 years and most of it holds its value with most of the depreciation within the first, you know, two months of, of purchase. Mm-hmm. So you have an asset class that's got longevity. People love instruments from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, all whether it's Dr. Dre uh, drum machines or uh, Jimi Hendrix Stratocasters that were played in the 60s. It doesn't matter. Green Day uh, plays um, Gibson Les Paul Juniors. There are instruments for every genre, every music lover that makes these instruments have, have value over long periods of time. So I'm a believer in those instruments. I'm also a believer in the long tail that people want to discover something unique and something special. And the fact that the industry has produced so many limited runs of things makes the used market more attractive than the new market to some extent. Mm -hmm. Like it's not just the new products that are coming out. It's the undiscovered used products that people are still seeking. So I think it's, I think we're not the creators of this. This has been going on for decades now. I think we're going to make it more efficient. And I think as a result, you are going to see us influence the supplier in terms of what new products are coming out and also influence um, a lot of the trends that we're going to make very transparent and visible of, of where the, uh, what, what used instruments are, are, are being uh, sought after and how they're being uh, used in different contexts and, all the the, the the beautiful content that we can produce from the many, many years of instruments that exist out there. So I don't see it as too controversial. I think that uh, suppliers will win from it. I think musicians ultimately will win huge. And I think the other thing is, is we're global. So we want an instrument in Tokyo, South, uh, Johannesburg and Berlin and uh, Los Angeles to be priced pretty fairly independent of location. And, and we're seeing that happen as well. And we're seeing instruments get to far corners of the world that maybe, you know, 10 years ago wouldn't have been the case. Well, that sounds like a pretty big impact to me. I mean, really. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me scoot on over to something else so that we can keep rolling. Because I, I understand now that uh, you've got well over 170 employees, uh, I'm told. And, and, and it seems that that... Uh, headcount is going to expand substantially in the next year. So I'm wondering if you could tell us what about the company culture you are most proud of and how you think that affects your business operations as a whole. And of course, the second part is, are there any or do you envision any potential potholes in that uh, area as you add a fair number of people fairly rapidly? You know, um, uh, growing, adding, adding people uh, to any organization has its challenges. Um, we do focus on musicians at all areas of our company. So whether it's an engine in engineering and software product, mobile developers, our customer service, marketers, um, fraud department, um, salespeople, everyone, you know, 85 to 90 percent of our team is musicians. So we have that common bond and that common cause, mm-hmm. which I think has allowed us to build a culture of, of, of people that really care about the company and care about our mission of making the world more musical. As a result, we're able to um, uh, we're able to retain good people and we're able to attract good people through the people that we have. Um, I think, you know, having built three or four businesses, I think I've, I've matured in the point where I used to think that they look to their CEO and their, their, their leaders for real guidance. Like, okay, the product needs to do this and the next version needs to do that. And here's our new sales strategy and our marketing campaign should be that. And what I'm discovering now is this, the, this generation of millennials that we're hiring is the brilliant. You hire, you hire really smart, creative people you share with them the vision and they come up with amazing solutions and uh, they don't want to be uh, bound by any sort of real structure in terms of how to do something or this type of campaign or write code this kind of way. Um, if you hire the right people, you can really scale your business because you're really empowering them to do, to build great things and help figure out good solutions on top of what we built. And that's the kind of people that we're hiring. And many of them grow into management levels, but even the ones that aren't in, 
in, in sort of management or leadership levels, they have huge impact here. So I, I've also learned, you know, bringing in that music style of improvisation, right? And, and you know, the guitarist doesn't tell the drummer when to put the fills in, right? That's you right. don't tell right. your, your keyboard player, you know, uh, you should use a DX7 instead of, you know, a Nord. You know, you let them discover the tone and, and you got to do the same in business. You really have to give people the freedom to express themselves, to be uh, creative and, and be creative within the constructs of what we're trying to build here. And, and that's, that's how we're going to scale and scaling beyond, you know, the team we have today also involves us being extremely um, uh, global in nature. So we're hiring across different cultures. I just came back from Tokyo yesterday. So I spent the week in Tokyo to learn about, the team that we have there, we have got a one person team there. It's going to soon be a three or four person team and get an office there. And then um, doing the same in Europe and, and, and other parts of the world, figuring out how we're going to um, um, be multicultural and, and have a very diverse team of, of individuals that can, uh, that can take the product into its next iteration. Well, that's you used some great metaphors there. And I think that's uh, what you're doing is you're going to attempt to continue to do what's been working for you and, and try not to let the, the culture get blown away by growth and things that, that get out of control. So uh, and you did mention and you gave me a great segue that, you know, you're a global company and you're you're certainly going in that direction. You know, there's a lot of us smaller companies, but larger companies alike and maybe even it's more of an issue for them, but we're now dealing with things like uh, GDPR uh, and other increasing regulatory issues. Just in the last few days, last week, uh, as you know, the Supreme Court uh, potentially complicated the, the sales tax issue for online sellers. So I'm wondering how these kinds of issues affect your business, how you deal with that kind of stuff. That's very difficult in some cases for small, smaller companies. That's the thing that always kind of worries me a little bit. Yeah. And the, the, so, um, you know, when you see the, the Wayfair Supreme Court case, you know, the initial reaction is, oh, no, how am I going to deal with this? This is such uncertainty and all the states coming after you in different directions and no real federal guidelines. And But then as as it, it starts to sink in, you start to think about how what we've done to help small businesses and what we've done to help um, uh, help consumers get better pricing Ultimately, um, it's a great opportunity for us to build solutions for people to whether we're collecting taxes from the buyer and remitting for the sellers and ultimately figuring out how to create a more level playing field without having to create a massive burden for sellers to having to deal with sales tax in 50 states um, and, and put on our, our innovation hat and see how we can actually uh, be creative. It's the same thing with GDPR. Um, we thought of GDPR as it relates to Reverb.com and the marketplace. And we built, um, we, we became compliant early on and we invested in that. And then we had a total win with Reverb Sites and we realized, wow, now we have a real out of the box solution for all of our Reverb Sites users. And it wasn't even our intent. Um, we didn't like, you know, think about it like that, but we, we now have that expertise and we have some of those core competencies. So as the world does get more complicated, it can be daunting. It can be intimidating. It can actually be like uh, stressful, but you know, like I said, I was listening to that Reed Hastings um, uh, podcast this morning and you know, he was shipping out DVDs and little red envelopes and he knew the world was going to streaming, but he didn't act like blockbuster and, and get stuck in how he was doing things. He, he listened to his customers and he had a parallel strategy to migrate the custom, the, the business to where it needed to be in the future. And same thing with content. So we, um, we want to think big and broad. We think we have a lot of customers that trust us and have, have engendered trust in what we've built. We take that trust very seriously and we want to make certain that we can offer more services and more uh, um, ways to interact with you know, millions of musicians throughout the world. It sounds to me like, I mean, as, as you're talking to me about that, that uh, that becomes another good selling point for your site's product and, and some of the other things you're, you're doing it. And uh, as a way for a lot of folks to kind of eliminate that, that problem, you offering a, a, a broader base solution that uh, allows them to not have to deal with a lot of things that they would have to deal with if they're doing it on their, on their own. Is that a fair, I, is that a fair believe, assessment? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Look, I like to uh, 
always like to close the interview and we're getting into that uh, point, but I like to close with some analysis and perspective. I don't think there's any doubt that reverb has changed the landscape in as much you know, as change is constant. I think we could agree on that. Uh, where are you going from here? I would say this, where are we going from here as a whole, an industry? And how do you feel about it? You know, I, I think like in, in the big picture, recognizing that there's going to be multi-generations of future musicians and the distractions that exist in the digital world that we live in um, for for the sort of the growth of music is probably my biggest concern. When I, when I, when I think of my kids, I think of uh, uh, young chefs today in the foodie revolution, right? And, and I think of gaming, how esports arenas, who is going to be out there touting and promoting making music as a, re, you know, more than just something you do in third grade and clarinet, something that is a life pursuit, something that can be with you and can bring joy to people um, globally. I think that is uh, becoming a big part of our mission is, is that how to get more people engaged in making music, the love of playing with each other at all levels. Like I don't want musicianship to be this, I often ask people, are you a musician? And they say no. And then when I re-ask the question, do you own an instrument? They say yes. So this idea that we could make more people musicians, more people being considering themselves musical and and be part of, uh, of, of, of making the world a more musical place, which is, is, brings so much joy to so many people, is, uh, is something we aspire to. So I feel that this is our first chapter is, is making gear more available and more affordable, um, more global in nature. And our next chapter is helping extends people's ability to make music with each other, get better at making music, maybe helping people book gigs, maybe helping people promote their music. I think there's a lot of different avenues that we can um, emanate from once we've got this core audience of musicians. Wow. Well, it sounds like an exciting future, and we're going to want to keep a close eye on that, and hopefully we can uh, talk again and see what's happened in the interim and get, get caught up. But I really want to thank you uh, for taking the time. Uh, I know you you have, a like I said in the beginning, a very busy schedule, and now you're 40 minutes late and doing whatever it is you might have done. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, this was the highlight of my day, Jeff, so thank you. Well, I'm I appreciate, thrilled. I, I appreciate the time to share uh, my story uh, with your audience, and uh, and I do look forward to, uh, to uh, getting back together in the future. So um, thank you for doing what you do and helping uh, share – uh, the knowledge and the wisdom of, of people in the industry with lots of great stories to, uh, to share. Well, it seems to be catching on. I think we're doing something right. I didn't know 20 episodes ago when we, when we started it, but I know a lot more now. And, uh, you know, you know what it's like to, uh, to be in the beginning and, uh, and see things happen. So it's an exciting time. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, thrilled to have you on the show. And again, thanks so much for coming on. You bet. Take care. Welcome back to the back of the show, where if you made it this far, you're probably willing to take a chance on unpredictable topics and discussion you might not necessarily expect on a guitar-related show. Now, before I go much further, I want to state again something I said many episodes ago, that this is intended to be a politics-free zone. But I want to clarify that what I intended to say and mean was that this is a partisan politics-free zone. But what does that leave if we can't fight for our side, right? The left side, the right side. Is it really a binary choice? You know, for years, I've written about the fallacy of left versus right or right versus left. The truth is, in my opinion, that in politics, if one person travels far enough left and the other person travels far enough right, they both end up in the same place trying to sell each other a slightly different brand of tyranny. And once again, it's all about branding. You know, a couple mornings ago, I woke up about 5 a.m. or so and just couldn't get back to sleep. For some reason, I was thinking about how political behavior has really been going in a markedly southern direction. And I'm not talking about geography. The polarization is not getting better. It's getting worse. We're not making progress on that front. I finally signed into Facebook on my profile and selected one of those 
you know, colorful backgrounds where you can write a simple post in big, bold fonts that uh, can be seen from like 100 feet away. I typed in a simple note. How is ever-increasing polarization helping our country? Just curious. Well, that's about as political as I get on social media. Compared to many, I'm very constrained. But it was kind of a rhetorical question. I actually expected some of my more openly opinionated friends to reply with their requisite rants that uh, it's the other side's fault and they're a bunch of idiots and worse and worse. You know what I'm talking about. But to my surprise, I got something quite different. People I know who frequently post negative, intransigent and uh, hateful things all seem to offer responses that essentially stated the same thing in slightly different words. It doesn't help. We need to change. It doesn't help. We need to change. And I have to tell you folks, there were a lot of comments and responses and after reading and replying to a few myself, I actually felt a little bit encouraged in a small way, but encouraged nonetheless. So here's my thinking. And again, I've been saying this stuff for a long time now. You can go left or you can go right, But in reality, those are merely sideways moves when the direction we really need to be going is up. Let me repeat that. The direction we need to be going is up. We need to rise above this mess. This is Einstein's insanity. We keep doing the same thing over and over again and somehow expecting a different result. It's just not happening. We are innovative people. Look at all of the fantastic things we create. Incredible ideas and advancements in so many areas. Imagine what we're capable of. And yet, for some reason, we're not smart enough to be able to develop meaningful advancements in political behavior. We're better than that, you'd think. Well, if you have any positive or productive thoughts on any of this, I'd love to hear them. I sense there's maybe a flicker of a movement in the up direction. There's probably more like me out there, a few more but our voices are mostly drowned out by those with agendas of hate on both the left and the right. But I think there's hope. Thanks for listening. And as always, do your best to stay positive, keep the focus on your destination, and make sure you leave all the options open on how you're going to get there. And I'll see you on episode 22. And that's it for this episode of Guitar Business Radio. Thanks for being with us. You can stay tuned and stay in touch at guitarbusinessradio.com. 